Chapter 10, Stationary Intentional Communities. In the 1990s, Hakim Bey coined the terms and developed the two concepts, Permanent Autonomous Zones, PASs, and Temporary Autonomous Zones, TASs. PASs can be defined as a community that is autonomous from the generally recognized government or authority structure in which it is embedded. In other words, it is a recognition that the PAS is located within the alleged jurisdiction of a government, yet it is a declaration that inside this zone, we are autonomous. Intentional communities of any flavor would be considered autonomous zones, yet the mobility of the Vanu home base, the place where you are most invulnerable to coercion, is the determining factor as to whether the zone in question is temporary or permanent. For this section, we will focus on the stationary intentional community, in contrast to the mobile ones we examined in the previous chapters, van nomad caravans and minimalist sailboat fleets. Rayo describes these passes as a smaller and more limited approach based on physical congregation of libertarians in a geographical area. These essential differences between an intentional community and a sovereign free port is admission requirements. The intentional community would be smaller, less involved in external trade, not possess legal sovereignty, and require less capital. To hammer this point in again, if the coercers can find you, they can coerce you. And in the case of this strategy, the bludgies will know exactly where your community is located. This is the main drawback to passes, as mobility is what provides the highest degree of Vanu. The community will also be expected to pay property taxes and ensure that they are abiding by local ordinances, codes, or else faced an escalation and coercion. Another disadvantage arises due to the fact that this is a permanently fixed location, that is, human conflict. Recall the permanent floating voluntary associations discussed above. If John had a major, major disagreement with Jane, all either of them has to do is weigh anchor and go on their merry way. With the permanent intentional communities, though, there's too much at stake to simply walk away. John and Jane may each have a substantial amount of capital invested in the land, in addition to the time and effort spent on developing it for, say, a permaculture farm. Not a great situation. All of that said, it doesn't mean this strategy should be tossed out. It just means that interested Vanuans must be more creative in how they go about it. So, if you're committed, and this is what you're working towards, how can you ensure the success of your intentional community? Well, unfortunately, there is no way to ensure success, but there are some things that you can do to mitigate the risks. First off, location, location, location. It probably wouldn't be wise to choose California, New York, Kabul, or any other extremely coercive or dangerous state. You should take into account weather, climate, population, legal intercises you can use, the different governments presiding over the jurisdiction in question, local, county, or state, nearest cities of any size for import-export, the terrain, average going prices for land, and, maybe most importantly, whether or not the area is incorporated or unincorporated. If it is unincorporated, you should avoid having to deal with the nuisance abatement, allowing the possibility of going completely off-grid. I'd also recommend that all members of the community be knowledgeable on security culture. After location, this is definitely the most important step and could be the deciding factor as to whether your community flourishes or dies. All it takes is one slip-up for the bludgies or private coercers to crash the party. For example, let's say Alvin met a guy named Bill and they became friends. Alvin filled Bill in on the community, but he didn't disclose the location. What should Alvin do at this point? Well, what he should do is properly vet Bill to ensure that he's not a bludgie bullshitter or an otherwise incompatible individual. Let's say he doesn't do this, and it turns out Bill's a bludgy trying to infiltrate the community. Let's also hypothetically say that there was some black gray market activity happening in his line of sight. It's safe to say that Bill would take this report back, and a big heap of coercion would likely be on the way. Lastly, I'd recommend a way to handle conflicts that may arise, likely some sort of internal dispute resolution system that is agreed to explicitly by all members. I'm not sure if intentional communities in the past have done this, but I feel this is one way to ensure long-term viability of such a venture. So what sort of folks might be interested in starting a stationary intentional community? Rayo believes that the intentional community approach appeals to the individuals who foresee an impending political economic collapse and or would like to try their hand at self-sufficient living. To others, it may be of value as a vacation spot. 
or as a bedroom community, where they could raise children away from many of the irrational influences prevalent in philosophically mixed societies. Those would certainly be the advantages of this strategy, in addition to the fact that you would be living 100% of the time with like-minded individuals who truly understand the notion of self-ownership and respect your autonomy. In conclusion, the disadvantages outweigh any potential advantages of this strategy, at least in my humble opinion. Yet, this is still something that individuals may wish to pursue. Take your time, do your research, and take special care in choosing who you will be living with.